Hi, my name is Dermot Gregory, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, using chitazan based shrinking fibers for post cure stressing, um, pre stressing to increase durability of concrete. Um, so, concrete durability obviously frames the motivation for this research, um, and the way we seek to improve concrete durability uh, is with shrinking fibers. Um, which theoretically combine the reinforcing effects of fiber reinforced concrete and pre-stressing concrete. Um, pre-stressing concrete uh, typically is achieved using cables, uh, pre-stressing cables. So shrinking fibers uh, have a benefit over cables for pre-stressing uh, because they uh, provide a more isotropic pre-stressing and inhibit crack growth a little closer to the source compared to cables because they're a lot smaller. Um, and they have a much more uniform distribution. So the two tests and methods of concrete degradation that we look at are freeze-thaw damage and chloride penetration. And both of those are pretty detrimental attacks uh, to concrete. So freeze-thaw cycling creates and progressively expands cracks um, in concrete, um, or I guess in any material, especially porous materials such as concrete. The water expands in the pores and creates little micro cracks between the pores until the force is big enough to split across or split open the concrete and sources of water keep applying. Um, <clears throat> if there's a source of water, the, the ice expansion can um, get really large. So uh, the other attack being chloride penetration. Um, so chloride ions uh, coming from salts degrade the passivating layer of rebar um, and corrode steel uh, that's you know in the rebar I guess corrode the steel rebar that's in the concrete uh, which subsequently damages the concrete and those corrosion elements uh, expand a lot cre also creating gaps in the concrete or cracks in the concrete um, so for this research, we made concrete beams that consisted of active or shrinking uh, chitosan fibers. Uh, and those specimens were compared to concrete made with passive, non-shrinking um, chitosan fiber reinforced concrete, as well as um, non-reinforced, just no fibers concrete. Um, and the chitosan fibers shrink in the concrete because of the high pH of concrete. Uh, it causes the molecule to go through reaction or a chemical process called amine deprotonation, where um, like molecularly, essentially there's an ion ion uh, repulsion that's holding the molecule open. And then the high pH um, deprotonates the amine group of the molecule and the molecules allowed to shrink back down. And subsequently the fiber can shrink back down and cause that pre-stressing on the concrete. So for the freeze-thaw testing, um, we made a bunch of uh, beams that um, in these prism molds that were 40 by 40 by 160 uh, millimeter um, prisms, two typos there. Um, they're allowed to cure for 14 days. Uh, they're wrapped in wet paper towels or wet towels, sorry, um, and cycled between an air temperature of minus 20 and positive 20 degrees C. Um, so the cycles were three hours long uh, where there was a half hour um, ramp down to a temperature and then a soak for an hour, half hour ramp up and then soak for an hour. Um, and that cycle was repeated 14 times um, before the specimens were all taken out of the environmental chamber and they were weighed, their lengths were measured and their impact resonance tested. Um, so that you could find, or we could find the fundamental transmitter transverse frequency of the specimens. Um, and you compare that at each test number to the initial fundamental transverse frequency of that given specimen. And you get something called the relative dynamic modulus, um, which as the dynamic modulus degrades um, or decreases uh, signals how much the concrete has degraded. Um, and a concrete beam uh, is considered failed when the relative dynamic modulus reaches 60% of the original. Um, so here, oh, so for each 
for each group of fibers um, or for each type of specimen, um, we created five different instances of that specimen um, just so that we get average um, and standard error. Um, so this chart um, plots the durability factor of some of those groups um, or of all those groups. Um, and here we're comparing the active fiber groups to the passive fiber groups. So active fibers were put, for example, at 1% uh, weight ratio, active fibers were put into concrete at a weight ratio of 1% and five beams were made of that. And then passive fibers were put into concrete at a ratio of 1% and five beams were made of that. And the average durability factor for the five beams of active here is compared to the average durability factor for the five beams of passive. Um, and so for the 1% and 2%, you can see that the actives on average had a significantly higher durability factor when compared to the passive groups at that respective uh, weight ratio. So for 2%, uh, which is the highest increase we saw over the passive, the active, um, it was 219% higher. And then we see significant increase over passive groups um, at weight ratios of 0.12% and 0.24% here too, as well as one and two. And then zero, um, the control specimens also had their durability factor calculated, but they uh, were neither passive nor active, so there's nothing to compare them to. But the 1% um, group was 540% um, or had a durability factor that was 540% higher than that of the zero weight control group. Um, so here's a photo of all of the specimens that made it to 300 cycles. Um, and you can see, we see some from the 1%, the 2%, and then the 0.24% active groups. Um, and then, so for the resistance testing, um, that we partially emerged uh, or immersed specimens. The same specimens were made. Again, these are prisms, not cylinders. Um, they were cured for seven days this time. Um, and they had four equidistant bolts sticking out of them to use as electrodes for a four point winter probe um, resistance testing. Uh, and so we cycled, we demolded the specimens, we tested them, and then we partially immersed them. So they were up to, they were 90% uh, of their height immersed uh, in salt water, uh, which was a 0.3 or 3.5% NACL solution. Um, so they were, again, they were demolded, tested, and then they were immersed for two days, tested again, and allowed to dry for five days, tested again, immersed for another two days, um, and then tested the last time. So here's the results from that last test or the second partial immersion in salt water for two days. Um, so when the chloride ions enter the, or penetrate the specimen, they increase the conductivity of it um, and lower the resistance. And so a higher resistance indicates uh, a higher resistance to the chloride ion penetration, uh, which would be less corrosion to rebar and more durability. So here we see the active fibers, active fiber groups from uh, three different weight ratios do, um, have an increased resistance suggesting that they have uh, increased resistance to the chloride ion penetration um, compared to these passive fiber groups. And we see this all along, not only after the second, we see them after all of the, or during all of the tests, except for uh, the first one, which was following demolding, where actually the passive fiber groups had a higher uh, resistance than the active fiber as a baseline. Um, and so the switch we see is actually more significant because, or I guess the increase we see over the passive is more significant because of the baseline they were switched. Um, yeah, so the highest increase we see here is with the 0.24 uh, weight percent, um, and it's an increase, the active weight ratio had a resistance um, that was 157.5% greater uh, than the passive prisms. So uh, just to 
wrap up, uh, I'd like to thank TIDC and the U.S. Department of Transportation for providing the funding for this research and Jim Wild of VTrans for being the technical champion of this project, which is Project 2.7. Zoom out here. Okay, well, I can't zoom out, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good nice day.